Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. We believe life is about how we react. We are really excited to present our interview with Kristen Smedley. Kristen is an author and she's an advocate for rare disease. I see her at like all the Pennsylvania rare disease events and uh, she's a mentor to me and she uh, is sharing in this rare disease adventure with all of us. So we're really excited to present this interview. Here we go with Kristen Smedley. All right, we are so excited to have this conversation coming up. Kristen Smedley, welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Hey, you guys. Thanks so much for having me. I am uh, I'm beside myself. I get to be on one of the super cool podcasts. So yeah. thanks, for, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kristen, um, I just watched your TED Talk, and I want to say to any of our listeners, if they're interested in Kristen Spendley, or, you know what, if you're interested in just being uplifted and being um, educated a little bit um, in a very, very entertaining way, I want everyone to watch Kristen's TED Talk, but um, Kristen, after people watch that, I want, or, or if they haven't, um, I want you to uh, give us your story in in your own words. Yeah, so, um, you know, my story is, I, I, I can talk about it now. I'm not exactly uh, proud of where it began, but, and, and uh, I don't know, I look back and, and kind of chuckle at it, but um, I, I was one of those folks that literally was living the dream. I mean, I had, I was a planner. I was a elementary school teacher. My life was, I had planned to do that since I was probably four or five years old. And um, I don't know what it is about me that I, I lay out, or I used to lay out plans and just follow them and, and everything worked out. And I had the, I had the perfectly manicured lawn. I had the, the uh, perfect house. It was back when, you know, the McMansions were the new thing. And in 2000, I had, I had the picture perfect life. Um, and then in a little exam room in Children's Hospital, Philadelphia, my firstborn son that I had every possible dream you could have for your first child, um, at five months old, that all went dark when a doctor said that he was blind. And, you know, I say that um, I, I crashed. I literally crashed to the floor that day. Um, under the weight of the dreams that were gone, under the weight of zero education about blindness, um, under the weight of failure, like everything went through my mind that my life was, was essentially over all the things I had planned. Um, you know, when I say I'm, I, at times I'm a little embarrassed to say that, but where I've come now is, you know, there should be no, there's no fault or embarrassment in, in reaction, um, early on. And it's why I do the work I do now. So nobody has to go through that. But, um, yeah, I, I, I realized that I knew nothing about blindness. That's why, I was so crushed and it took a long time for me. Um, maybe I'm a slow learner, but there wasn't a lot of information out there. It took a long time to, to bounce back from that. Um, and then to have the same, this exact same situation play out three and a half years later with my second son, um, the same diagnosis this time at four months old, um, you know, just, a, I say it's a, it was a double dose of darkness back then and to a, do a doctor said the exact same words the second time around as the first time i don't know what to tell you good luck mm -hmm. um that was my starting point so um you know it's a double dose of darkness back then it's um gosh it's a double dose of brilliance these days and um when you see the ted talk and you and you've seen it kyle it's uh it's been quite the journey ever since 
Yeah, mm. so so Kristen, you are so incredibly positive and this is such a crushing story. How did you learn to see it differently um in in the face of this devastation? You know, that's such an excellent question because I am actually in in my DNA is positivity and creativity and I think it's from you know, I grew up not having much. My parents didn't have much, and and my parents could always find the positive, right? But when you're crushed like that, there is no amount of motivational speaking, positive DNA, nothing that can bring you out of it. And I think that was my biggest struggle because I was always able to find the silver lining. I was always, you know, my parents would help me pray stuff away, like. There was just my upbringing was was not strong enough um, in positivity for that. But it was my son. It was my oldest blind son, at Michael, at three years old, that literally bounced. He always bounced. He still like when you watch him. He's a nineteen now. <laughs> when you watch him walk down the street, he bounces like he's just the happiest person. Um, until I tell him to do stuff he doesn't want to do, then that's a whole other thought that we could have. <laughs> But um, who is he to have his own personality at 19? Come on. Um, but anyway, he, I was so struggling um, when I was extremely pregnant with, with my Mitchell, my second one, that there was no way I'd be able to handle it a second time. And he literally bounced in my room. And, and his line to me was that I tell everybody, he said to me, isn't this the best day ever? That one little sentence changed our entire lives thank god because and i looked at him and i was like are you kidding me i mean i'm sobbing he can't see me sobbing and um i would learn later that that kid can tell from a mile away what your emotion is (laughs) but you know he couldn't tell any of that and he says it's the best day simply because he was three years old the sun was up he had everything he needed with his little you know legos and lincoln logs and stuff and he was just so happy and, and it was, thank God that moment happened, because that's when I learned all I could do was follow his lead. I didn't know anything about this. I had to get him all the tools that he needed. That was my job as a mom, right? Okay, you got to go about your life with no sight. I'm going to get you all the tools you need, and I'm going to follow your lead on what your dreams, your aspirations, your interests. And honestly, I talk to parents now, and I wish, not that I would wish that parents have a crushing moment in their journey, but I wish that they would have the shift in perception early on in their kids' lives that they learn to follow their lead instead of us putting all of our stuff on our kids. Yeah. Yeah. You're the mom. You're supposed to know what to do. And uh, you're supposed to have all the wisdom in the world, right? And all of a sudden the, the game is turned 180 degrees around and I think that's a huge show of character to recognize that, all right, I need to take a back seat here and I need to follow this three-year-old because he seems to know what's best for him in, in many situations. Yeah, exactly. And, and what parent wants to do that? It's like, wait a minute, I read all the books. I, I'm three <laughs> chapters ahead of you, you know? Here we go. And, and, I, um, and it was a very, uh, it, was, it was little... I was a little nerve wracked with, you know, I I don't know what the next step is. Um, But honestly, following his lead and and researching everything I could about, okay, you know, I can't pray this away. And there was no back then. I mean, that was 19 years ago. There was no research happening in the in vision restoration. And I actually think that that was a good thing because I just had to immerse myself in in the in the world of blindness, how people did things. yeah. And and literally follow him. So So hmm. since since you mentioned like the science and stuff like that, um can you tell us a little bit about CRB1 LCA? Yeah, so basically um I say it's a it's a one two punch to the retina. So it's your rods and your cones. It's the cells that that give you detail and color vision and the ones that give you nighttime vision. I mean, all the different components, the two massive components to being able to see all day long and mostly at night. Um, the CRB1 LCA just, just hammers that early on and then it continues to hammer it until there's nothing left. So it's, it's essentially 
a lifetime of degeneration happens in the first few months of life. And, and there's a lot of science to say that it's actually happening in utero as well. Um, so it's like the retina doesn't stand a chance. Um, right. And now there's also CRB1 RP, retinitis pigmentosa, that's a little later onset. Um, and those kids seem absolutely fine vision wise until about 10, 11 years old. And then it's a rapid degeneration yeah. and, and you can debate either side of the coin who's got the who's worse off because my guys have never known anything different you know so how, to be 10 years old and sometimes you know that's hard how is this inherited and what's the prevalence like how many people have this disease so for CRB1 LCA there this is a little bit of old data that we're actually working on right now to update because of all the advances in genetic testing but it's estimated about 300 kids in the country um, have CRB1 LCA. And, uh, and it's one of those that, um, you know, for parents that go through the guilt, and especially in rare disease and stuff like that, it's both parents have to be carriers. Um, and then they stand a, a 25% chance with each pregnancy. So it's not like, you know, one in four kids that you have. It's every single pregnancy stands a 25% chance of an affected child. Right, right. So let's go back. So you have two kids with this condition and let's, can you talk about the difference in their reactions to the disease and to blindness? Is, is that a fair question? Oh, you know what? It's actually what I, I love to talk about because, and you guys, you guys probably are aware of this too. People tend to to sit in camps that are extreme. It's one way or the other, you know, and, and like, especially in the blindness world, there are people that just sit in the camp of I am blind and, and this is how I'm made and this is how I'm going to go through life. And then there's others that say, well, maybe there's a chance, if there's a chance for this to be changed, I'm going to go that route and pursue some research to change it. And, and they feel like they need to be in either camp. And for me, the, the, one of the greatest things that has come from having two kids affected by the exact same thing and watching how different they are, one says, I am good to go. I have all the tools and resources I need. I don't need to see. Hmm. And the other one says, are you kidding me? If that's going to make my life easier, sign me up. And you can tell that one's the <laughs> oldest and the other one's the middle child that is like, Look, my middle son doesn't even, he's got rules that, do I really have to wear pants on Saturday? I mean, <laughs> don't invite anybody over. Don't sign me up. It's my leisure day, you know? But they're so different. And and what? A, and then I have a, a sighted daughter, throw that into the mix. Um, and it it really has, you know, for, for a pun here, opened my eyes to the fact that our people are just so unique, each one of them. And I have to go about parenting them and, and guiding them as they are, they are each unique in the way that they look at the world and the way they want to experience it. And <laughs> it's funny. They are so, Michael and Mitchell could not be more different. And when they actually have a conversation where they agree on something, I like have tears streaming down my face. I'm like <laughs> exhausted trying to find common ground with them. But they're specialists. Uh, of it, at, at Mass Ioneer in Boston, Eric Pierce, he looked at me one day after a day of testing and watching them all day long, how they go about their day. And he was like, God, Kristen, they're so different all the way down to their retinas. Like mm. they don't even present <laughs> in the disease the same. I'm like, yeah, we're the extreme cases, but wow. yeah. Funny. I love that. I feel like, so, so go ahead, Sean. Well, I want to, you, you mentioned your sighted daughter, so I assume you just have the three children, right? Right. So your youngest is a little girl who can see and everything seems to be perfectly fine. What is, um, well, I guess it really depends on maybe how old she is, but what's her response to the family home life? You know, um, Chris is 14 now, and honestly, it's it's been um, it's been an amazing ride to watch her born into a family where full inclusion is is the game. I mean, she doesn't see the barriers that the rest of the world sees when you I'm doing air quotes over disability. Um, she really uh, it's been she has witnessed from day one differently capable would probably be her take on it. Everybody's capable. 
just in different ways. I mean, it's so normal to her to have two brothers that can't see that, you know, kids make such generalizations. When she was about three, two and a half, three years old, she had a friend over and the friend saw the boy's manual braille machine on the kitchen table, which looks like one of those old typewriters. And the little friend who is probably three, three and a half, that comes from a huge family says to her, what is that? Chris is like, it's the braille machine. Like, duh. Yeah, like, and and her friend was one? like, I have no idea <laughs> what that is. And Chris was like, you have three brothers. How do you not know what that is? <laughs> Chris assumed all brothers can't see because she had two. Sure. <laughs> I couldn't right. see. It's just a normal, it's a normal way of life. Now, I will say at 14, you know, there's sibling rivalry. There's, you know, uh, if one, God forbid, one kid at the table gets the bigger slice of cake, you know, and then you got to keep, especially her and Mitchell, they're only 13 months apart. So the competition is there. Um, But so she does have some elements of that. Every now and again, I'm like, dude. They, they, he can't see. I know he's driving you crazy, you know. <laughs> and, and one time, one time we were we were uh, down at Disney World, and and she had had it with Mitch. I mean, he was like he can really drive a person crazy when he wants. He's the button presser, and and she had had it, and and I was like, Chris, think about it. And she's like, you know what, Mom? He's driving me crazy. they going on and on. And I go, well, let me tell you something. I'm always trying to like find one positive thing to switch her mind, right? And I said, think about it. You got Michael and Mitchell with you. You know, we do you know that no one else gets to go to the front of the line in Disney World? You know, no one else gets all this treatment. You, you know, they act like, you know, they've never seen a cane before, so they're going to, like, roll out the red carpet. So I'm going through all the perks of, of her brother Mitch, and all of a sudden she looks at me and she goes, you know, Mom, really comes in handy to have these boys around. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's awesome. yeah, she's good. I I feel like your your family, the three kids you just described, is sort of a a, a, a case study of like <laughs> the fact that we all react differently to things, and it's really valuable to be able to just recognize that, and um, it, just in every situation in life, you know, like everyone reacts differently to everything, whether it's blindness or F.A. or cancer or whatever it is, um, you know, being too tired one day, like everyone reacts differently to that, you know. And so I think it's really valuable to recognize that and, and appreciate everyone's reaction and just take it as like everyone does things differently, you know, and, and there's a lot of times there's no good or bad. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and, and we have open, our, our house is an open conversation thing. I mean, we talk about stuff. I think, I think the families that don't want to talk about, I mean, we had a family uh, one time whose, whose son had ADHD on, on Michael's football team. I mean, Michael's played football. He's played everything. And, and the kid was driving everybody crazy. And the mom, I said to the mom, you know, he's driving everybody crazy. She's like, do not mention his ADHD. I don't want him. I don't want people to know. I don't want him labeled. And I'm like, but they don't know. They don't have any education on this. You're not telling them. So they think he's just being a jerk. And that was a big eye opener for me that the more people know what's going on and you can educate even in little fragments. That's what I do with social media now. Little fragments of education. It just it breaks down all of the, the preconceived notions that people have or the stories they're telling themselves about you or, or your situation. When you give them the information, it's completely different. It's completely different. I wish more yeah. people would do that. Yeah, and I think when you put it out there, like all of a sudden you can get past it. You can go beyond. If you don't, there's no way around it, right? It's always there. And like... I feel like that's one of the concepts of this podcast and even the title to disabled dude. It's like, all right, there, let's get past it. We put it out there and now let's talk about life. Like we're, we're disabled. Like this is a thing that it's just what happened. Right. And it's no one's fault, whatever. Now let's, let's figure stuff out. Um, and yeah. I think it's yeah. really valuable to talk about stuff like that. And, you know, like the way I look at it, look at, uh, you know, you with the, the wheelchair, my boys with the cane. Those are, the, people think that's the barrier. It's not, that's not the barrier. The barrier is when you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to know about it. You don't want to, and you, you're like, you 
force this, the, the other folks, you know, in public force that barrier. Those items aren't the barrier. They're the independence. They're the magic bullet, you know, to, to have a condition and still have this incredible life and independence and, and all of that. It's, it's the attitude about it that's the problem. Uh, love that. Yes. Totally. It's crazy to think when, when you see somebody that is perfectly abled and they feel set back because they're making a minimum wage or, um, you know, the house is smaller than what they want. And those are the big barriers in their lives. And then when you when you look at somebody that's, you know, either walking with a cane or striding along in their wheelchair or whatever their uh, challenge may be, it's a completely different world. And it's eye-opening to realize just how much we can succeed and how much we can um, do and be significant in life. If you just look past whatever your challenge may be, big or small, just looking beyond that opens a whole new world. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not about disability. It's not even about ability. It's just about your, not just about, but a big part of our battle every day is your perspective. Yep. Oh, okay. Absolutely. You know, I, I talk a lot about um, um, the acronym CSEE, Set Extraordinary Expectations. And in my work, because people say you've had this extraordinary life. And I, when I talk about extraordinary, I don't say it as, you know, out of reach, that no one else could possibly do this. I talk about extraordinary as something different than what people ordinarily think. So you get a blindness diagnosis. Ordinarily, People would expect you to sit on the couch and cry and oh, poor you, and the world would have given me a pass to sit there and be bitter, be sad, right? Yep, that's perfectly the extraordinary part. Yeah. Yeah, the, the extraordinary part is, okay, you sit in that for a minute, and then you get educated, and you do something differently. When I went through my, oh my God, I'm still in my horrific divorce, but when that first started, I did the exact same thing as when the, the blindness diagnosis was delivered. I sat there wallowing, right? And a friend of mine said, I said, I can't get out of this. I can't shift my mindset. I'm using everything I teach people and I can't do it. And she said, what did you do when, when you were, had the blindness diagnosis? You, know, you, you went out of the ordinary. You looked at it differently. And I thought, okay, she's exactly right. I had to go and do it. Everybody says, oh, my God, now you're a single mom with these three kids full time and two of them are blind. Again, life was going to give me a pass. And I'm like, that's not me. So I went and found the people that were on the other side happily. I actually yeah. also do look at people on the other side, not happy. So I don't do what they did. Right. <laughs> right and, yeah. and yeah, shift the perception, look at it different. How can I make my journey out of what would be ordinarily expected? And, um, and it does take, Look, it takes a lot of muscle. I, I got way stronger in my face. Um, I leaned on a lot of people, and um, it took some time. I had to allow myself the time and grow. And, um, and I'm on the other side of that so much better than I was before. But I think if people would, when they come across setbacks, um, come across situations that they feel like they have no control, you actually do have control. You have control of how you're going to look at it, and then... Stop the pity party and figure out the tools that you need to get yourself where you need to go. Yeah, I think a big part of it, as you know, is like, all right, looking at it objectively, right? And removing the emotion a little bit and being like, all right, what do I need to do right now to get past this barrier and then on to the next barrier, right? And um, yep. and really breaking it down and, and and as much as you can, removing the emotion and looking at it very objectively, and that will help you, I think, get get to the point where you can get around that and then on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, and and I think I mean at least for me, the best way the the way I learn the most to work around something and get over something, or at least work with it in my life is to talk to people that have been there or been on a very similar spot um, as yeah. I am. And, and that's, you know, the whole, you know, role models, mentors. I was listening to you guys, one of your um, episodes debating hero versus mentor. <laughs> um, 
which was another hilarious. I love listening to you guys. Cause I, and I end up like talking and, and laughing and yelling, like you're sitting here talking to me, like you're on a recorded <laughs> nice. podcast and I'm talking to you. But, um, yeah, I, that has been my go-to. I mean, that's why I put the book thriving blind together. It's people that I talk to along the journey to say, what can I expect? I'll even call, um, I called the one guy in my book, Kirk Adams, who, who runs this massive organization in this country. And I called him when I, I was trying to figure out something for my son about an organization that didn't want him to take part in something. And the way that he shifted my focus and perception on how I was going to look at that challenge in, in a matter of a minute and a half was incredible. So yeah. why go it alone? Go talk to yeah. the people that have done it and figured it out. Right. So, Kristen, you bring up your book. I want everyone to know about your book. Um, everyone is listening. So can you tell us a little about it? Yeah, so Thriving Blind was supposed, it started out as a pamphlet. Because, first of all, when I announce that I'm an author and I publish this book, I can tell you for certain that English teachers all over my county were passing out that had me in their <laughs> class that I actually wrote a book. Because for the poor folks that had to deal with me writing term papers and even like a poem in third grade because I don't do anything the way anybody else does. I can talk all day. Having to write, forget about it. So anyway, it was supposed to just be this little pamphlet because here's the thing. I, I did not want another mom to go into a retina special o specialist office or, or exam room and hear, I don't know what to tell you, good luck. Mm -hmm. And it was still happening. It's still happening to this day. <clears throat> so I thought, that's not cool. There's no resource when, when I was given that diagnosis. Um, I'd be a jerk if I didn't turn around and hand a resource to these families that I know I can put together. So it was just going to be this pamphlet that I wanted every specialist to hand a family to say, I'm, I'm sorry that you're diagnosed with blindness, but here's a few people, a few motivational stories that there's still possibility for your child. And here's some resources. And then it just ballooned into, I'm like, oh, a pamphlet, that's not really going to, um, how much is that really going to do? And then it became, um, Michael could not get this ridiculously goofy book in fourth grade, he couldn't get it in Braille. And it was that Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I know children everywhere cheer over that series, but I used to read the books my kids were reading, and that sucker, I lasted about a minute and chucked it across the room. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever read. And kids <laughs> love it. They love that series. So anyway, that was the book. And Michael still cracks up to this day that that was the book that launched me into being an author when I couldn't stand it so much. But my, my issue was, I wanted to find out where the problems were in providing books in Braille because we could not get that thing in Braille when everybody else had it in their hands in print. So those two missions combined together for Thriving Blind. That's why I self-published it. So I went and talked to, um, I interviewed 12 people and the 13th person, Eric Weinmayer, the blind mountain climber that's done all seven summits and, and has a resume of what I call craziness that I don't want my boys to ever be on his email list to find out his latest adventure. Thank you very much. But um, his family has been incredible mentors for us for our whole journey. So he did the forward for the book for me. But it's 13 folks that are literally thriving blind. They're succeeding without sight. And they are everything from a stay-at-home dad to crazy Eric Weinmayer that's doing all these adventures. Because I wanted folks to understand that there is still – the gamut of possibilities for folks that lose their vision. Um, not everybody wants to climb mountains. Not everybody wants to be the CEO of a massive organization. So it, it's kind of the whole, it's just like the regular world. You know, some right. of us want to be stay at home parents. Some of us want to go off and travel all the time. So it's really geared towards the, um, the parents that, that need to understand that there's still possibility for their child. But the funny thing is, I mean, I, re I was editing those stories going through my divorce, and I took something from every one of those chapters to get me unstuck from where I was in a whole wow. different situation. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, pretty cool. Fantastic. All right. The book is called Thriving Blind. Kristen, I want you to tell us um, in the few minutes that we have left, I want you to tell us about the 
Curing Retinal Blindness Foundation. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I often say it was the one of the greatest things that could have been said to me 19 years ago in that diagnosis room was, uh, there's no hope, good luck, because it forced me, it forced me to really get my head and, and my heart and my hands around blindness. Um, but then along nine years later, um, all of a sudden there was some work coming out into the major media about gene therapy to reverse blindness. And so I got involved with some big organizations and, you know, back then they weren't steering your efforts and your fundraising to your specific gene because then we found out the gene a little while after that. Um, so, so, you know, what's a person to do? We break off, start something on our own, this little patient organization with the intention to develop um, at least the basic science for gene therapy. But then, I, look, I was, I was trained my whole life to be a third grade teacher. I don't know the science. I don't know any of that stuff. And I'm looking at my two kids and I'm getting phone calls from moms. And I'm like, there is no way there's one answer to this disease. And I don't know nothing from nothing. So then we kind of branched out a little bit, looked at some other options. Um, and now it's, what, eight years later, and we have patients from all over the world. We fund research around the world. Um, I'm actually gearing up to do a, a presentation at the biggest vision research conference in the world. Um, but my thing is, it's not, the Curing Retinal Blindness Foundation is not just about research for a cure. That's only half of our mission. The other half is educating the families that are living with blindness on how to, how to thrive, not just survive it until there's a, there's an option for a treatment. And, and that's born out of my two boys. One is interested and one isn't. So my goal is from diagnosis to potential treatment, our organization is the bridge. And my work is all about that bridge, that these folks have every tool and resource they need, and I want, it, I want options for a cure on the table, and it's up to the patient whether they want to take that option or not. And I want it to be a hard decision that they are so comfortable in their own skin and in their own lives that that's a hard decision. So We talked about a lot of stuff and possibly, you know, your main message was already covered, but I want to leave our listeners with your last word, sort of your overall, what you, what you hope to communicate to people partly when you speak, but partly what, what you want to leave people with today? Yeah, so, you know, the biggest thing is, and I often say this, if I, if Kristen Smedley can do this, if, if I can go from crying on the couch to as an elementary school teacher to running a global organization that is changing what it means to be blind, and do it in a way that I am happy and positive and see all the blessings in my life. If I can do this, anybody can do this because I did not start out this way. And if you look at my journey, I get slammed with things every now and again that I was just writing a, a blog that said that it would make the strongest warrior quit and, and the world would give me a pass on that. But if I can do this, so can everybody else. Everybody has it inside of them, whether, whether they had a family that cheered them on or not. Um, you got it in there. You just need to take a look at it a little differently. Find the people that are a few steps ahead of you, even 10 steps ahead of you, emulate what they did, reach out to them and, um, make your life extraordinary. Yes. Nice. Very good. So, Kristen, how can our listeners follow you and everything you're doing? Uh, so, everything I do is at my website, kristensmedley.com, and it's Kristen with two eyes. Huh, isn't that funny? You got two eyes. I'm in eye research uh. and all that. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, mom joke. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody spells it wrong. I even had to buy Kristen with an e.com, you know, because everybody spells it wrong. But it's kristensmedley.com. You'll find the foundation stuff there, the book there, um, my speaking stuff, and the TED Talk there. And then I'm on social media pretty much everywhere. Um, at, usually it's at Kristen Smedley. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Well, Kristen, it has been an absolute pleasure. You are an absolute, absolute. powerhouse. 
and someone truly that I look to as a mentor. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story with our listeners. Hey, it, it's been incredible. Thank you so much. And, and right back at you guys. I follow you and, and you guys are mentors for me as well. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Find us online at twodisableddudes.com and please subscribe on the iTunes. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And special thanks to our audio producer, Jake Tompkins. Until next time, keep living with urgency.